we start the talk proper, I just want to um, remove myself from any of the responsibility of doing this. So I, I've just got sorry, this disclaimer. Oh, I need to turn myself on, sorry, okay. One more two, am I on? Yeah, yeah, I'm on. So I've got a disclaimer, and this is, um, I wanted to show you this, because this is, this is a piece of text or a set of slides that whenever I'm running an education project, in, um, in a public setting, I, I always have this playing in the background. I don't necessarily refer to it, but I have it playing in the background. And I think one of the things that I might come on to talk about as we start discussing um, the work that I'm showing today is an anxiety that I have about the expectations that are put on education projects when they happen in galleries, and, and that perhaps some of the burden of those is, is, is troubling and, and limiting to what those events can be and, 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 and prevents the relationships between curatorial and learning from being more dynamic than they could be. So this is not a performance. Um, there's also another disclaimer, and that is that the rather marvellous website um, for Modern Art Oxford says that um, the latest in our series of lectures from leading cultural figures, and I want to say I'm not a leading cultural figure, I wouldn't see myself in that way, but the reason I think perhaps I might be able to talk about the subject today is because I've, I've ended up having a foot in a number of different camps. So I, I as, you, as Emma described, I'm the programme director for Art and St Martin, so that means that I oversee the, the, the programme. It's working in higher education, at university level, BA and MA. And so I have a foot in terms of what learning agendas might be there. But I also um, have done years and years of work in gallery education. And I came through to higher education, through gallery education. So, so I was an artist who was invited to take part in a number of projects within lots of galleries, like Tate, like Camden Art Centre, like Kirk Museum, Art Oxford. Um, so that, that's another strand that I'm interested in. And I've also ended up working within primary and secondary schools as a sort of um, project leader for, for art projects that were being run within those sites. So in that respect, I've, I've, I've had a, uh, a look at those different ways of seeing art and education. Um, and perhaps not everybody in the sector has, has had the opportunity to do all three. It's pure coincidence, but it's so it, it happened that worked. Um, I think it's an incredibly timely talk, this one now, and again, that's, that's, that's just fortuitous. I don't think, well, certainly I didn't have a clue it would be timely, but, but maybe, maybe perhaps you all did here at, at, at the museum. But, um, because what's happening at the moment is that there is a systematic attack on arts education happening in this country. We know that at primary and secondary level, um, thanks to the EBAC, arts education is being marginalised. We know that within galleries, funding for our education projects is in lots of ways being cut away. In some instances, because I was speaking to Kate Squires, who was the um, teaching and learning coordinator at Camden Arts Centre, and a lot of her projects, the money had been redirected from the gallery to the schools. And the schools, faced with a pot of money, were no longer willing to spend it on the art when they could spend it on maths or English provision. So what that means is that, once again, within, a, within an idea that seemed like it was a, a good idea, devolve the power to the schools themselves so that they can pick, inevitably, because of other forces on those schools and other pressures on those schools, arts education shifts away from galleries. And then within higher education, Again, there is a problem in, in, uh, in the arts in that post the £9,000 fees, post now the, the white paper that's being um, put forward, what we found is that um, although courses are recruiting, the breadth of students that used to apply to fine art is massively reduced. And we're finding that we overwhelmingly get um, white middle class students and, and that's, that's not a healthy environment to be in and there's all sorts of reasons why that might be the case and we perhaps can discuss some of those later on but, but what we all need to do within these sectors is start to really think about how we can come together and, uh, and, and provide a united uh, front against um, what I see as a sort of um, yeah, systematic assault on the arts in this country. Uh, if for no other reason, I mean, there's very logical reasons to do it. Partly, I'm very passionate about the arts, but perhaps not everybody is. But in terms of a, um, an area for economic growth within this country, the arts provide an extraordinary amount of um, infrastructure support, jobs, money, uh, prestige. And, and, and these attacks will have um, problematic 
effects later on. Um, so that's perhaps why it's interesting to talk about it now. Uh, there also has been, I think, it, for all sorts of reasons, a very firm separation between what we call curatorial and what we would call learning within, within the sector. And, and I'm going to argue today that actually those differences are very artificial, they're arbitrary, they, they, they needn't be imposed in that way. And that certainly a hierarchical um, understanding of that, where curatorial is at the top and learning somewhere down the bottom with sort of, you know, uh, potato prints and glitter, is, is, is actually not, not, not healthy and not, and not very accurate either. Um, what perhaps is less well known is that this country is, was, has been, is at the forefront of um, radical experimental teaching models both within gallery education and within um, fine art education in, in the university sector. And, and a lot of the really daring advances in, in how we might teach a group of students a subject like fine art really happened here. And, there, and certainly in Europe, there's a lot of focus on what Britain did in the 60s, 70s and 80s as models for what they're now doing within the gallery sector and within, and within higher education. So we've got this amazing um, resource here, that this um, uh, yeah, set of developments that happened here that we, that we risk throwing away if we don't now come together and really see how we might sort of make the most of them. Um, so this is just an example of um, radical teaching from, from the 60s. This is, this is the, um, the now very famous locked room experiment that happened on the A course uh, at Central St. Martins. And so perhaps I'm, I'm attached to this particular example because I now am at Central St. Martins, but there are equally good examples in the basic design course at, uh, at Cardiff. Lots of very exciting ones within gallery education. And we were just talking earlier about archives that hold gallery education. There's an amazing one in, uh, in the Yorkshire Sculpture Park. There's a very, very good one at the Whitechapel Gallery. And all these places have very good examples of, of interesting teaching. But this one, I wanted to mention this one just because it happens to be at St. Martin's. And so what they did was that they would grab the students, they would take them to a room, and, and to what extent this is true and to what extent this is myth, is perhaps, this is not perhaps the right setting for it, but I'll describe the myth and we can unpack it maybe later. And they would give the student one material, they would lock the room for a week, and the student would be in that room and they would make and make and make and make. And what was interesting about it was that it moved away from an idea that the teacher had the knowledge and the students were there to just receive that knowledge from the teacher. And what it suggested was that you, the teacher creates structures within which the students develop their own knowledge. Now, I think that's crucial within the arts because what we're, one of the problems that, that the arts faces is that there's no direct career ladder beyond your MA, say. What do I do now? And I've been teaching now at HE for about 15 years. When I started, there wasn't a single student who would ask me, what do I do next? Because there was an understanding that you bummed around, that you kind of fell out of college and you got a job somewhere and maybe you ran around Europe for a while and maybe you formed a band and maybe and eventually you fell into something. The, the financial pressures are so acute now on those students, there's no way they can think in that way. So students, and, and, and perhaps in London it's even more acute because students have got a city that's incredibly expensive to live in, but they're, um, they're living miles away from the university now because they can't afford to live near the universities. They've got massive loans on top of them and they know that they need to come out of college and start earning far. So the, the, every single student is now asking me, what do we do next? But because there isn't a, a, a career ladder in the same way that there might be, say, you were a doctor, where you know you go from registrar to senior registrar to whatever those things might be, what we need to do is equip the students to create their own structures. And that's where something like this is very, very useful. This model of teaching equips the students not to just ha have a body of knowledge, but to have an approach to critiquing uh, the prevalent uh, established models and creating their own models that serve their own purposes. And I think if we can do that, then we do end up with, with a set of um, educational institutes that really do provide uh, a really interesting support for students from all sorts of backgrounds. The question is how do we get that, that, that idea out there? How do we communicate that successfully to students? Okay, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about three or four projects that I was involved with or that I ran um, because I think they serve as useful models for what happens in this grey area between curatorial 
and, uh, and learning or teaching. And so I'll introduce a couple of them and, and there'll be some issues that, that arise from them. This one is called He Made Me Do It. And it's a project that I did with Tate. It was a year-long project working with teachers and I was talking to teachers who weren't art specialists about what um, arts education could provide for uh, non-art subjects. So given that we do it this way in art, is there anything we could learn that might be useful in maths or in science or in something else? So th they went on as, 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 as required, but then at the end of it I felt that I had to invest myself in, in this stuff that I'd started talking about. And I said, well, I'll go into your schools and I will work with a whole class at one time rather than with individuals and we will, over the course of a morning, make a piece of work. And, and, and that's why it ended up making it. Now, I ended up in trouble over this piece, and I'll tell you why later, but, but I'll, I'll just show you a clip from it first. You get the idea. So, what's happening in that video is that the school children are all asked to make a mask that, that holes for the eyes and the nose are cut out in advance. And they were all asked to make a mask that had my face on it. So all those brightly coloured things were meant to be me. And, and the accusation is, is thrown directly at the camera. He made me do it. What I was interested in unpicking was um, the assumption that... Um, projects done with school children are um, uh, benevolent, fuzzy and cuddly and nice, and that what the artist does is walks into a room and asks the students what they would like to do and, 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 and gets them to, to determine what they're going to do, and that's how we're going to learn something. And I'd, I'd like to pose a different educational approach to that in this project. And I felt that I was what I was doing was I was... Um, showcasing what I felt were some of the inherent power hierarchies within that sort of community project uh, way of working that perhaps weren't always declared. So my feeling was that as an artist coming in with, to a group of, of young people, that the, you're the artist, you have a different power relationship to what you're doing than that group of young people who are, who are waiting to, to get information from you. Um, but all too often, it, it pretends to be something it's not, I was worried about. And I'm saying all too often. There are some cases where, of course, it doesn't. There are some cases where it does. But, but there are some examples where it felt like it was pretending to be something it was not. And so I wanted to show really what it was. It was me being the monster behind the camera, making them do something. Now, they, they, they attack the camera and say, he made me do it. But even that declaration of... Um, you know, liberty, I, we, are, we won't be oppressed by Alex any longer behind the camera, he made me do it, is something that I've told them to do. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm making them do everything, even the, the, the apparent freedom of accusing is actually something that I've, that I've um, constructed. Um, but my, I have a lot, well I'd always had a problem with an idea of freedom and making work collaboratively, because I don't think freedom really operates as simply as that. If you get a group of young people and you give them a blank piece of paper and you say, draw whatever you want, that's freedom on a certain level. But what you get back from them is four stars, a couple of unicorns, lots of rainbows, and perhaps some clouds. And maybe, a, depending on the clouds, you might even get a skull. And because what they do is they, faced with the openness of that question, they revert back to the things they already feel they know how to draw. They don't know how to, how could they think beyond what they've already understood? They, 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 there are parameters to what they know, therefore they function within those. My idea is always to, to do the opposite, to impose a load of restrictions and then allow the project to mess those restrictions up, to challenge those restrictions, push against them. You give them a wall to kick against and, and there might be more freedom in that model. Now I'm not saying that's the only way to do it, but that was just a model that I became quite interested in. It's a model that I've done a lot in gallery education, but also a model that I'm now applying in higher education at, at BA and MA level, 
Um, and certainly one that I did a lot when I was going into schools to do projects. So I, okay, this is my, this is my excuse for why I'm, I, 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 I'm <laughs> such a bossy monster, is I declare what I'm doing to the students. I say, I am imposing these restrictions for these reasons. You can challenge them if you want. And in some cases they do, and in some cases they don't. But certainly from my point of view, the joy of working collaboratively is that I don't get my own way. I never get my own way in its entirety because someone's always going to kibosh the project this way and that way. And, and so I'm getting the benefit of my frame of knowledge, what I thought was going to be the limits of the project messed up because the people I'm working with misunderstand it or, or deliberately misinterpret it or, or, or are antagonized by my restrictions, push against them. And the group of, of young people or students who are working on the project also go beyond their, their known frame of reference because I've imposed a whole series of restrictions that mean they can't do what they wanted. And so the classic example of the drawing would be to say, well, if I say draw what you want, I get a set of standard images that I would expect. If I say, here's a piece of paper, we're going to draw for exactly 30 seconds. The pencil will not uh, leave the paper, but by the end of 30 seconds, the line needs to have touched each four corners of the page. A whole load of restrictions there, but actually what you get back from that drawing is very unexpected. Lots of the, of, of the, the group do it in different ways, and it, and it's, and it, is more, and, and it looks more like freedom than, than the one that apparently was free. So, so that's perhaps why I've used that approach. And again, I'm not saying it's the only approach or that it's the right approach, but it's one that seemed useful to me. Um, this is a project misguided that ran at uh, Tate Modern when they opened up the oil tanks in, in, uh, in what is now the new build. So the oil tanks were open for, I think, about six months or something, weren't they? And a series of projects happened within them. A series of, and the idea was that the oil tanks would house um, lots of performance and video practices that perhaps couldn't be housed in the rest of the building. And learning also had a, a, a project. And this was the project that they did, and they brought me in to, to run the project. Now, the idea was that Tate had was that learning and curatorial would be seen horizontally and not hierarchically, that they were both important, they were both presenting things that had a visual output within the gallery, but one would be around, would have certain learning agendas, and the other would have curatorial agendas. It was a very brave effort, in practice it didn't quite work that way, and I mean, I, I wasn't compromised by it, but I was certainly in the middle of it, and, and, and it was... Um, it was fairly tense, the relationship between curatorial and learning. And, and I would say that we're now in a position with a, within lots of galleries, and I know that it, it, this is, is a case in point, where those questions can now be asked. Can learning, can the stuff that happens around um, bringing groups into galleries have the same status as the stuff that happens around bringing works and placing them within the space. And I would say that if we can get to the point where we understand that the status is the same, and that actually a lot of what we're doing is the same in those two arenas, that we, we'll end up with a much healthier um, set of possibilities within the gallery. It's also, I think, crucial that we do that, because that means, if we do that, it means that higher education, primary, secondary education, gallery education, and, um, and the sort of gallery curatorial, can come together to present uh, uh, a different voice to what's happening to the arts in this country. If, we, if, if those different sectors don't come together now, we will continue to see the art provision within this country eroded. If those sectors come together and manage to provide a united voice, I think we stand a chance of, of um, putting the brakes on certain things. So I'll show you a few seconds of Misguided, and then I'll talk to you a little bit about what perhaps was interesting about it.
Um, so, uh, Misguided was, uh, I was invited to produce a, a, a set of works that would um, not just pr uh, give learning to the students who took part in the project, but would provide learning for other students who might come and view it. So th there'd be sort of like a sense of there, there were instructional videos or something. Um, and, and actually, I was much less interested in instructional videos and much more interested in um, disinformation, misinformation. I think that the, um, the danger with, and, and, and they're not always bad, I think it can be very useful to have information in galleries, but the danger with those big signs that tell you what something is about is that the audience goes to, this is about blah, 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 before they go to the work. They, they see it through that prism and, and A, they feel like they don't know enough because they need to have read that before they can look at that. And B, they, they may not be bringing to their understanding of the work their own ideas because they've been given this, this um, you know, paternalistic voice. And I would say that that model is one that's perhaps a more old-fashioned teaching model in which the teacher has the information and the student receives the information. The same happens for the boards on, on and Tate is a very good example of these big boards. And some of them are, are great. I'm not, I'm not anti them necessarily, but I think that to question them and challenge them is it was to me seem more interesting. So what, what we did was rather than a series of tours, we did a series of anti-tours that ended up being performances in the space where myself and a group of 60 um, young people from, um, it was the, I think there were year um, eight pupils, so for secondary school, um, would once a week devise a performance in relation to the works that, that, were, that were being shown in the gallery and we'd go in and um, apparently go from piece to piece and do things and, and people were invited to follow us if they wanted but no actual factual information was being passed on it was just their response to things it was at no point did they say this is a work by so and so and this is what it means it would just be we've created a massive cape and it's got words all over it and deal with it and, and, and that to me again seemed like it opened up a much more playful questioning of what the show was rather than this is what you will learn and so what in the end what we ended up doing was we had instruction and, and a lot of what you saw in this in this film just now were the instructional videos that they were making of how to make some of the things that they made in the performances so that that thing where she's got a rather sinister sort of head dress on cover it in tape was actually to make a series of masks but the instructional video doesn't fulfill its own potential. It, can't, it doesn't really instruct you in how to do it. It just gives you a sort of tiny clue as to what might be happening there. So the, the, there was the film, and the film would get rolled into the oil tanks once a week, and project, uh, there was a big sort of screen on wheels, and the film would get projected onto that. And then the performance happened around that film on the same day. Um, and the students worked between the, the gallery and the education room, which had been set up as a film studio. So we had a track all the way around, and that's how you get these moving shots with the kids standing still, with a set of lights around it. So it looked like a TV studio. They would go into the TV studio, create anti-information videos, get those thrown into the gallery, and then create anti-information guided tours of the gallery space for anyone who wanted to come along. OK. Um, I've also included this project because I thought it was interesting in that it combines um, uh, an artist practice, my own, with um, a higher education institution, Central St. Martins, with a local primary school. Um, St. Martins moved to this site, Granary Square, um, five years ago. And uh, this had been an area that for a long time, you know, this area around King's Cross, had been very deprived, had um, uh, had, had lots of uh, problematic social housing that wasn't really functioning, wasn't working. And so um, Argent, who owns most of this site, uh, had very cleverly put together this, this um, development plan that means that it's, it's all gone unbelievably um, posh looking with big high rise buildings with executive flats in them all, but a lot of the, the original housing that was there has been demolished and a lot of the original residents have been moved on. But there, there are still um, areas of, of King's Cross, pockets of it, that retain the, the, um, 
the feel of, of the King's Cross before this project happened. Um, but what, what it always felt like was that St. Martin's was this UFO that had kind of landed in the middle of this thing and was being seen as the cultural hub of, of the redevelopment. And, and I'm always a bit suspicious of cultural hubs, and I'm very, very suspicious when arts organisations get co-opted into being cultural hubs for things. And so one of the things that, that this isn't just my idea, this is lots of people at St. Martin's, had the sense that they really wanted to um, use the fact that the university was there, not just as a resource for students coming into the courses who would do the courses, but also as a resource for the local schools, local community projects, local... Um, businesses that would also provide um, opportunities for, for, for those sorts of people to come and make something out of St. Martin, so that, so that we, we had a, respond a duty and responsibility not just to bring students in, but also to take what we were doing out into um, uh, King's Cross. Um, in this project, I made a big ball with um, a group of um, school children, they're, they're primary school children, and they're year, f they're, they're, they're quite small actually, they're year four. Um, and so we devised a way of making this thing, we made the ball, we made our costumes, they all made them with us, um, and then we, it was part of a project that was called Unannounced Acts of Publicness. And for me what was really exciting about it was that it was not as the name suggests, nobody knew when these things were happening and nobody knew if they were art or not art. And if what we're talking about is removing hierarchies within these systems, one really good way of removing a hierarchy is to not call it art anymore. And so this thing happened, I arrive with a ball, with a group of young people and we push it around the fountains outside St Martin's, but at no point is it called anything other than a ball and some people who look a bit like aliens. It, was, it wasn't art. And the it not being art thing uh, can sometimes be quite, quite a useful strategy for, for escaping the inherent hierarchies that exist within um, those art worlds. So that's why I included this one here, just as a... Um, I'll show you a few seconds of this one, but it's less relevant. Um, so, um, in this project, this is, this is a, uh, what I would call a school project rather than a gallery project. I, as an artist, was commissioned by a gallery to go into a local school and work with a local school to develop a film project with a group of A-level students. And that sounds great, and it was a really fun project to take part on, but the danger with that project, and it's something that we always have to be aware of, when, when, when you start mixing between those different forms of education is the toes you're, you're stepping on. And if you're the artist being brought into a school, the first time you do it, I think you imagine that the school is going to be delighted that you're there and that the art department is going to love that you're there to do this marvellous project. What you don't realise is that the art department has a, a, a thousandth of the funds for the whole year that you have for one project over three weeks, that you can bring in the most exciting materials ever and the most marvellous equipment to get this project done, while they're there with you know, some gaffer tape and a bit of you know, polystyrene. And, and there might actually be some resentment from the institution and from the school about why are you helicoptering in artists when we have expertise within the school who could do this, giving them the money, not us the money, and allowing a project to happen for a brief period of time that then leaves the school and leaves us in the same predicament, or a worse predicament, because now we've now seen what a fun project could be like, but we don't have the funds to make it happen. So, so one of the things that I thought was really important about working with the schools was A, to get to, to, to talk to the staff in advance to see if they wanted to participate in the project, so they felt some ownership over it, and B, that, that we would create some infrastructure through the project that would stay in the school after it. So, so for this particular project, all of the shots are moving, are moving camera shots. And that's either because there's a dolly, which is a, um, 
there's a really good website, I can't remember what it is, but there's a really good, you can look it up on YouTube, there's amazing websites for how to construct your own cranes, your own dollies, uh, and your own tracking shots. And you basically make all these things out of um, skateboards and, and bits of plywood. But there's, there's the, 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 the dolly shot is a piece of wood with some wheels at 45 degree angles, and they roll over some plumber's pipe, but it means that you get a very smooth shot moving across, so I can make my camera move like that. Then the crane shot is with a camera with some weights on one side and, and a flipping movement at the front, so the camera always stays horizontal. And it means that you can have those sort of sweeping shots that you have at the beginning, where the camera comes down and then moves across and then moves up. And, and these things were things that we built with the students and with the staff, but they then kept them. So they were then able to make a series of films afterwards that might have been useful for them. So it was a way of thinking through some of the, the, the problems of, of working with others and seeing if that couldn't become a strength rather than a weakness for the project. Okay. Galleries and art schools. So, in a sense, that those are my projects. Uh, I'm not going to talk about my my own art projects now. I'm going to talk about me as head of Central St. Martins in a way. Um, head of the art program at Central St. Martins, not the whole Central St. Martins. Um, when I first started teaching, um, and we were talking about this right at the beginning, when, when I first started teaching, I was very concerned that teaching, my own work that I made in the studio, were completely different things, had no interconnection between them at all, and I would keep them absolutely separate. And I think the reason I was doing that is because my, I, I'd only just finished my undergraduate degree, I felt that my practice was a very, very vulnerable stage, and what I made had to be art with a capital A and could not mess about with the edges of things. It had to be bang in the middle of it, because otherwise it might not be art anymore, and then I might not be an artist anymore, and oh my God, what's going to happen? So, so I, I kept things very, very separate. But as I, as I started working in, in those arenas, I started to realise that actually those separations weren't very useful, and that actually if you allow what you're doing in teaching and what you're doing in... Um, gallery education and what you're doing in the studio to become one practice. Um, certainly for me that meant that A, I was able to make much more work, but B, there was always a real urgency to why I needed to make that project successful. So if anybody comes to me and says I want to work in this area, the first thing I would always say to them is there's one question you need to ask yourself about any project that comes along and that question is what's in it for me? If you can answer that question, and what's in it for me is I get a piece made out of it, or what's in it for me is I get um, to work with an amazing artist, or I get to be in an amazing gallery. If you find what, those, what those, the benefits of that project are, the way in which you engage with it is going to be much more energetic than if you try to um, be too benevolent. And I've said that word benevolent a number of times, but, but sort of benevolence and, uh, and arts education um, I, I'm a bit suspicious of. So, galleries and art schools. Um, there's, there was seen to be a sort of separation between these two areas. That there's the galleries, and they exist in one place, and then there's art schools, and they exist in another place. And one deals with primarily with teaching, uh, and the other deals primarily with curatorial. And, and what I'm going to argue is that those divisions don't really exist anymore, if they ever did. That, that galleries and art schools share an enormous amount and, and work in very, very similar ways and produce work that in a lot of ways is very similar. And that if we can break down those divisions, it's a much healthier place to be. That's just a picture of Central St. Martins. Um, and that's a picture of the degree show. So the first thing to say is that, of course, art schools are galleries, because art schools open their doors to the public very, very regularly for um, public exhibitions. This is the degree show from a couple of years ago, from three years ago. Um, and it's interesting to note that during the days of the degree show for fine art, and there's only, there, it's only open for five days, during those five days, Central St. Martins gets more visitors per day than Tate Modern. So, in terms of it being a public resource and a public space for viewing art, it is a public space for viewing art. Now, I understand it's only for five days, but, but still, it's, it's easy to underestimate that function that art schools have. Um, the next thing is to say that art schools are, of course, an incubator for galleries, 
because the, the students that come through art school are in many instances not going to become artists, but are going to become interesting people in the arts generally. And that might mean that they're working within pre-existing galleries. They're coming to, uh, to here, to Camden, to Whitechapel, to work within those institutions. Or it might be that, and I've brought out some examples here, that what they're doing is setting up their own spaces. Um, at, at CSM, we do have a tradition of student um, led projects that leads to artist run gallery projects the, um, and so we've got here is Auto Italia that's um, Banner Repita X which is a gallery that's in a um, in a train station um, X marks the box ship is a publishing uh, cooperative that had its own space then moved to Matt's gallery and is now about to move to a new space but it's yet we, we don't know which one and Arcadia Misa again is a uh, uh, publishing and art space that, that has been running for, for a number of years now. These are all artist-run initiatives and they all came out of thinking that happened in art school. So uh, they, they can't be separate because one, one comes from the other. They're completely embedded with one another. Um, just purely selfishly, I'm also showing you um, just that. That's the, that's the current show at five years. Um, five years Gallery is a gallery that I co-founded in 1998. Um, again, it's an artist-run space, and as an artist-run space, of course, you function differently to a public commercial, a public gallery, or a commercial gallery. But um, but certainly, this is something that also came out of art school and has been running for probably too long. Um, the other thing is that galleries often invite art schools to per participate in the program. And so, again, that, that, um, the sense that the work that's done in an art school and the teaching that's done in an art school is not just a way of instructing people, but it might be a work in its own right, is something that lots of galleries have become very interested in. So this is a project that we ran this year at the Palais de Tokyo in Paris, a massive contemporary art space there. And what we have here is we have three different courses. We have architecture students who built the infrastructure, we have fashion students who produced a series of instructions to destroy artworks that art students had brought into the space um, as part of a performance. So the, the fashion students would say, take that piece of artwork, cut a hole in it, jump up and down on it 50 times and cover it in blue paint. And then the artist would have to take their precious bits of work and publicly destroy it in front of everyone. But it was, it was effectively a workshop becoming a work of art. And, and lots of galleries are now working in this way, where workshops become works of art. I was invited to do one here, in fact, and I don't have a picture of that one, I didn't think of that, um, in which I ran a workshop over two days, and the workshop was open to the general public. We had a, a group of um, A-level students who took part in the project and made the work with me. We made a giant inflatable sculpture that floated. Um, but, the, um, but the work of art was coming and looking at me, barking instructions at a group of young people who had much better ideas than I did, and, and we sort of solved it as we went along, and that, that became work. Um, Tate Exchange is... This is, this is slightly um, uh, confidential information, so don't spread it, but um, I'm about to sign the contract, so it won't be confidential very much longer, but... but um, the art programme at, at um, Central St Martins it has been given the Tate, Tate Exchange is the new build in Tate, the brand new building. One of the flaws within that brand new building is learning. And again, that's interesting because it's open to the general public, that learning floor. It's not as in most galleries where the learning happens behind a closed door. This is something that you can go in and view and, and, and take it as another room within the galleries that you would see. We're taking it over for, for a week in January, it looks like, and what we've proposed is that we're going to run an alternative art school within it. And so you might be able to come along and get a PhD or get an MA or get a BA um, over the course of a couple of days. You might be um, instructed in how to create your own timetable. You might figure out how to um, do an anti-life drawing. And, and there's all sorts of playful kind of reworkings of the, the structures that, that conventionally make an art school that are being unpicked, not by us, the staff, but by the students themselves. Because the students are usually the ones who, um, if there's a problem, they tell us. 
And so they're the ones who are in the best position to critique some of the ways in which we do things. So, so we've let them do that for this. So that's a project that's going to be happening at Tate Exchange. But again, that's a model where the art school becomes the artwork shown within the gallery. There isn't this separation because one coexists within the other. They, they, they do things for each other. Um, Remember Nature was another project that we ran at St. Martin's with Gustav Metzger. Um, who asked us to reenact one of his works in which 5,000 newspapers are um, placed on a large table and over the course of a week students cut out any reference to extinction within those newspapers and pin them to the board. Um, what was interesting about this project was that it was a project that came to us, Central St. Martins, from Gustav Metzger and the Serpentine Gallery. So again, it wasn't, it wasn't an, an, an education project, it was a gallery project, it was a Serpentine. But the Serpentine wanted it to be housed within an education institution because they felt that that link to education was crucial to the, the project's success. So again, the, 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 these blurrings that happen again and again are, are there for the taking. Less relevant, really, but just examples that, that it's, not an, it's not the only example of it happening. This is Camden Arts Centre, a project where students curate an exhibition once a year in Camden Arts Centre. This is a project at the Petri Museum, where, again, the students make work in relation to those ancient artefacts and present them within the Petri Museum. And this is an image of a project that was done at the British Library. So there are lots and lots of examples of our students making works within um, uh, galleries, museums, arts institutions, um, and they're doing it somewhere between learning and exhibiting. They're not saying that this is the same as the object that's in the glass vitrine, but what they are saying is that an, a, an experimental teaching project can take the form of an exhibition. It doesn't have to be a sort of a lecture or a seminar or a tutorial. There can be other ways in which that learning happens. This is something that I, I kind of only sort of figured out today, I think, um, is that I think some of the most exciting developments that are happening in higher education at the moment are developments that first happened in gallery education. And it's counterintuitive. One always imagines, again, because we're so um, preoccupied with the hierarchies, that the... the higher education would come up with the exciting ways of, of teaching and then perhaps gallery education would copy them. And actually, I want to argue that it's the other way around, that a lot of the developments that happened in galleries are now being taken up by higher education institutions because they really do present some very good models. Um, this is a workshop that, that I ran with um, a group of um, MA fine arts students here from St. Martin's and a group of MA Fine Arts students from a Japanese institution. Um, and the reason I think it models itself on, on gallery education is that it, it, it doesn't give the students freedom. It tells them, you will be making a piece of Alex Shady work for two days. Um, it's going to be like this. We're going to, these are the parameters. This is the materials. This is the thing. Typically, at higher education, what you want to do is give everyone room to explore their own practice. But I think now what's, what's interesting, what's coming into a lot of the courses that I'm running, is, is actually a moving away from that and saying, isn't it interesting to force students to come together, to not contemplate their own practice, but to contemplate a member of staff's practice or, or another person's practice for a brief period of time, tighten, 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 tighten what they can do, and then release them back into their studio after that project is finished with a, a real hunger for their own practice and perhaps a different understanding of how they might develop work. They're not going to make the same work as me, but they might suddenly understand if I restrict the materials, something positive happens. That might be something they've got from this particular project. So, so it's... it's, it's perhaps counterintuitive, but I would argue that by tightening and restricting for short periods of time within, uh, and this is actually MA, it's not even BA, within an, an MA course, you can then give them much more freedom when they go back into the studio and, and, and unpack what they've done. The, um, 
And again, the reason why I would say this is like gallery education is that it uses some very conventional ways of working gallery education, where if you have a group of 30 students, one of the classic strategies is you start off with everyone doing an individual bit of work, they all do a drawing. Then groups of two come together to bring those two drawings together. Then those two groups of two come together with another group of two, so groups of four are working together. Then groups of eight work together. And it's a way of, of allowing everyone's voice within the group to be heard because they've all made an individual gesture and yet to bring it together into a collaborative moment at the end. So it's, it's, it's a standard strategy within gallery education. It's not often used at higher education, but this is how we made this. Each person made a bit of the costume, then they tied the costumes together in, in small sections and then eventually we made one giant costume and we walked around. This is a first year project that again I, I, I would say is very much modelled on the sort of work that... Oh, no. So what, what happened for Yellow was it, it's a first year project and it's a way of combining um, a social need, the students need to get together to get to know each other a little bit better, with uh, a studio need uh, and, and, in, and in for this particular piece the, the need was to understand that if when you're making something you consider all the possible versions of that thing that it might be, you get, you get more for your money. So in this case we've had a dinner party in which everybody was asked to wear yellow and bring yellow food and drink yellow drink. Um, and so we have a performance of that. We have a video in that they've um, uh, filmed themselves while doing that and that became a video. And they have a sculpture in that the, the, the remnant of the dinner party, the table with sort of food all over the place, was left in the street for a week. So rather than making one piece of work, they made three and certainly um, one of the things that I'm always telling students is that, that um, it's kind of like a, a really horrible secret, but, but art's easy. Um, and that's not to say good art is easy, but art is easy. And, and just a few tricks can help you um, get a lot of art done with perhaps limited resources, limited time, limited um, anything. Yeah. No, no more yellow. Um, the other thing that I think is interesting about um, art schools and galleries at the moment is that the public events as opposed to the main focus of what an art school does or a gallery does um, are often opening up these spaces to very very different audiences and I think again this is a really vital um, part of these institutions that they continue to do this. If we have art schools where um, primarily the students are white middle class then what can we do with our public events to engage and entice a different sort of audience to come to, the, um, to, come to, to those art schools? Because actually, in a way, once you've been to them, once you've, once you've dead enter the art school, and St. Martin's is not an easy building to enter, because it's, it, it's this big, epic building with this massive atrium space. It kind of looks scary. And if you are uh, perhaps the first person in your family to go to university, you might think St. Martin's is the last place you ever want to go to. You know, 5,000 students all running around, all seeming like they know what they're doing. How could you see yourself in there? But if you've been to a series of things already, that might be a way of engaging you to come in. And there's just a couple of quick projects to show you here. that are, They're not art projects as such, but the art program houses them. We run them within the art program. One is this project called Metaphonica, and it's run by Dan White, who was in a band called Fowls. Um, and he is interested in why we don't get any pop stars coming out of art schools anymore um, in the way that perhaps we did in the 70s and 80s. I would argue that the reason we don't is because art schools have ceased to be a place where you can just drop out. Oh, sod it, I'll do art because I'm not really interested in doing anything, but it's a way of sort of, you know, doing nothing for three years and I'll set up my own band. And that sounds like a bad thing, but I think there was a lot, of, there was a lot that was good about that. We're not in that world anymore. We're not in that economic or political reality. There's no point pretending we are or hoping that we would be again. We won't be. But, but I think this project that he runs, where he brings in a load of um, very funny, very interesting musicians, opens up the art school to, to a whole different um, 
set of, of young people. That's one of the performances of Metaphonica. This is the Anarchist Book Fair that, again, we, we ran at um, CSM last year. It nearly killed me, the Anarchist Book Fair, because um, it's an amazing uh, institution, the Anarchist Book Fair, the most extraordinary event, but we slightly underestimated quite how many people would come through the doors, and we pushed the, uh, the infrastructure of CSM to breaking point. Um, we almost couldn't cope with the number of people that came through. It was also, um, as one might expect, very politically charged. That's partly why we wanted it to happen at St. Martin's, because we think that um, acts of rebellion, acts of defiance, should be able to happen within art schools and art galleries. Um, but unbeknownst to us, there was a, there was a, um, a big protest that was happening nearby the book fair on the same day. And so what we had at the end was the book fair had just finished and we suddenly had about 50 police cars parked in front of CSM um, trying to block off um, a group of the anarchists who'd gone from the book fair to the protest. The police were trying to move them on. They didn't want to be moved on. And they were trying to get back into St. Martin's as a place of refuge. But I didn't want them back in St. Martin's because we were closing the book fair and the last thing we wanted was a protest that would be happening there when the students were meant to be coming the next day. So it got, it got very messy and difficult, but I'm really glad we did it. And, and, uh, and I do think that if there's something to be got from the difficult political situation now, I think what it might be is a new, invigorated, politicised set of students, artists, gallerists, who, um, faced with, with the reality of the politics right now, have, have, have got to, to be very aware of politics. When I was an undergraduate student, we were not thinking politically at all, my generation, I would say. Certainly I wasn't. Um, and the students that we have now at St. Martin's are unbelievably good at um, challenging, questioning, ar around political concerns. They, they, um, they fight the institution very regularly. They have, they have a real sense of institutional critique inbuilt into what they do. And I wouldn't have any other way. I think that's vital. They should critique and they should question. It doesn't mean I always agree with them. I often say no, but they, they, they should critique and question. Um, and I've gone on, oh gosh, I've gone on for hours. Um, that's it from me, but I wanted to open it up to questions at this point. Um, there are... Other things I could have mentioned, but I haven't mentioned, like the impact of Brexit, for example, on both the gallery model and higher education model, something that we're all having to wonder about at the moment, because there's perhaps not very many definites. Um, I didn't mention too much about the, the, the new fee structure in universities, £9,000, and the white paper that's perhaps going to allow certain universities to increase their fees. I didn't mention the REF and the TEF, the REF is the Research Excellent Framework that um, determines how much top-grade international research is happening at a, at a university and allocates research funding dependent on that. The new thing that's being brought in is the TEF, Teaching Excellent Framework, that will again assess the quality of teaching within an institution and give funds dependent on how well they do, which sounds very well in, pr in principle, but in practice, the metrics they're using to analyse whether somebody has good research or good um, teaching are perhaps suspect. But I haven't mentioned those things because they weren't strictly speaking to do with this, but I thought I'd just you know, slip them in. That's it. <laughs> Any questions? like misguided yeah. how much did you tell the kids you were working with about um, what why you were doing these things what you were interested in I always would I always do I don't necessarily show that because um, 
in, in the finished film. There's no moment where I'm like, kids, the reason we're doing this is because of this. Partly because I want to make it a bit difficult on the audience. I want the audience to have to worry about whether I've done it right or not. But, but also partly because I don't think it's the main point of the piece. But with the students, yes, I will always go through those things with them. And we'll start by workshopping a series of... You, you, mostly my interest in those things is around power, power dynamics. Who has the power and who doesn't have the power? And we'll do discussions with the students about who has power within their groups, within their institutions, what power means, how you transfer power, how you pass on information, is knowledge power. And those sorts of things get discussed with the students. So hopefully by the time they come to make something, they have an understanding. Now, Inevitably, sometimes you describe that better than others. Some students get it better than others. But, but I would always want that to be part of what I was dealing with when I, when I talk it through with them. Surprisingly not. I said I want to do it. I said it would be useful for the art program for these reasons. And they said yes it, it instantly, really quickly. There, 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 there's quite a lot of um, quite brave decision making happening at sort of much higher echelons than me. Um, that's not to say that then when we actually had to do it, my God, it was so much work. And I don't see health and safety as a problem in universities. I know lots of people do. I don't. But partly that's because we've got the most amazing health and safety officer who always says that he's never going to say no to anything, but he is going to say this is how you make it safe. And if, if I keep learning those things, then I get better at mounting these things. And if the students keep having to do these things, they get better at being able to deal with external institutions once they leave. So, so I don't necessarily think it's, it's a massive problem, but it's definitely a burden. And, and it, it was weeks and weeks of work around... Um, health and safety, but also around public access, because we had, to, um, we had to have creches for children who typically aren't allowed into the building. We had to have um, ushers and stewards, because the, the amount of people coming in was just vast. Um, we had to have all the health and safety numbers. All of that stuff had to, had to happen, and that, that's, that's the bulk of the work. The, the, the nice bit of all these amazing people came and they had the most extraordinary bookstores and, and the books were fantastic. That happens really easily and really quickly. It's all the stuff behind the scenes that, that, that can be the burden. But maybe that's all right, yeah. Um, I've, I've always um, heard that gallery education should kind of be as a way of people en en um, engaging with the collection. But it seems that you're suggesting really we should be um, approaching it on a wider scope um, and inspecting and um, art practice and, and other things. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Certainly. Um, I would say that that's my interest in gallery education and that not everybody has to follow my way of doing it, but I'm interested in, in the wider picture. So... Um, what I certainly would say is that if you're looking at a particular artist's work and the gallery education is simply mimicking that work, not much learning is going to happen. So I would say that if you're looking at a painter, it's much healthier to make a series of sculptures in response to that painting than it is to make a series of paintings. But I would also say that for me, I'm interested not just in the painting, but in the nails that hold the painting on the wall and in the person that has to protect the painting and in the set of curators who decided to include that painting and in the set of artists who weren't included in that exhibition and why they weren't included. All those questions are the ones that interest me. So I, I typically bring that to the projects I do. Um, but I'm not invited to do projects where that wouldn't be appropriate because I think the people I work with in those galleries know that's not going to be a good one for Alex, he won't get it. But, but so another artist might do that who might be much better at, at working with the specifics of a particular artist and how you unpack that for an audience. That doesn't interest me as much. Um, so yes, yeah, some of those wider questions are the way that I enter into the work. I also think that, uh, again, because I asked my question of what's in it for me, I might sometimes have a more perverse response to an invitation from a gallery than I would do if I hadn't, been, if I hadn't asked myself that question. And typically, I think 
galleries like that, they might be a bit annoyed in the first instant. Oh, God, Alex wants to do this thing, you're a nightmare. But actually, in the end, they actually like the challenge of it, and they like the fact that you've not just gone for the straightforward answer. So I think, in my case, it's been to my advantage that slightly, you know, overthinking it. But, but, it, but, um, but again, it, it works to my advantage because I work in gallery education in a way that's very close to my practice. And that's why I think it works for me, because I, I haven't separated those things out and said, right, now I'm doing potato prints and now I'm doing real work. I've mixed those things together and allowed them to coexist. I, an, an important point that I didn't mention is that whenever I run a project that's getting people to make work for me, A, I tell them, you are making a piece of Alex Shady work, but B, I also say to them, only in a particular context, if I show this work in a gallery, I will say it is a piece by Alex Shady with the collaboration of these people. If you show it in a gallery, you can call it your work. And I, where possible, because often I'm working with video, and with video very easy, I give everyone a copy of the video, and I say, you can show it and call it your work if you show it in your space, but when I show it in my space, I'm going to call it my work. And so it doesn't, that doesn't remove the ethical questions of how dare you instrumentalize a group of students to make work for you. But it does, I think, open up the, the ethical arena and, and, and sort of make it troublesome for everyone in an interesting way. And I, and I declare that before the workshop starts. I don't present it at the end. I say to them, this is what we're doing. Do you want to engage? And the participants never mind. The schools often mind. The galleries sometimes mind. <laughs> yeah. I just wondered, um, have you had any ideas or views on how, if you feel quite strongly similar to me that lots of galleries are just addicted to sort of whacking up huge amounts of text on walls and saying this is what it's about? And I just wondered if you had any ways, or do you ever thought it was possible that we could wean galleries off that kind of read this, then look at this, then move on sort of attitude? I mean, I think you're right. I think you hit the nail on the head. It is really difficult because you are having to wean them off. And it's because there are so many people invested in that. And, and the problem for me is around art can sometimes obscure what is not that obscure and can make more difficult what needn't be that difficult. And, and I think that's a problem. And that's often around the writing that surrounds art can do that as well. And that's not to say that everything has to be simple. There's, there's room for complexity as well. But there, there are ways in which you might do it that are simpler. And so a lot of people that come to galleries feel that they don't know and they don't understand and that they're being conned. And you put the text up there to give it legitimacy, to give the work legitimacy, and let those people who are feeling anxious about not understanding um, a way in. So, I can see that it serves a very important purpose because we want to make galleries available to everyone, not just art experts. But it's really beautiful when you take a group of six-year-olds to a gallery who will never worry about knowing and not knowing. They will just have opinions. And something happens between there and 18 where suddenly we learn that our own opinions aren't necessarily good enough and we need to know stuff. And we don't know stuff, so therefore we can't have an opinion, so therefore we have to go to the wall on the text. So I would say that the best way to start to shift the problem of too much text in galleries would be arts education at primary and secondary that allows the voice of their own opinion to, to matter. And I think that it's not that... I'm not saying that it's some sort of relativist moment where you can think what you want about this work and it doesn't matter what it actually means. I'm not saying that, but what I am saying is that if you learn to ask the right questions, if you learn to um, structure your thoughts a little bit, your opinion is as valuable as somebody who is an artist and knows loads and loads and loads about why that particular piece was made, knows the history of it and knows everything. Um, you will come at it from a different perspective. And that's, in a way, you know, when I started this talk, I did that, because what I said was, I'm not, uh, whatever, whatever I was meant to be, a leading, your, you know, thinker in the field, I think. Um, I'm just an artist who happens to work in this arena. And, and if, if, as a person arriving at a show, you can say, I'm not, I don't know much about art, but I, 
I don't know, I, I manufacture screws, so I know a lot about screws. I can give you a really interesting guided tour of this exhibition and what screws were used to hang what bits of work on the wall in what ways. That would be fascinating and just as valuable and just as interesting as the person who could tell you the history of a piece of work. I also think that the that writing and writing about work and work are two parallel practices. They're not, one shouldn't be at the mercy of another. And so I, I don't like writing that says, this work is about blah, 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 blah. Because the work, if it can be reduced to that, it, it probably isn't functioning very well. So what you hope is that the writing opens up a series of um, questions, a series of theoretical issues, a series of surprises, but it doesn't explain away the work, and so it, it, it's in parallel to the work. It's another way of making you end up with more questions than answers, but I think both the work and the writing about it should do that. So perhaps writing that's less dogmatic would also be a way of improving the experience for, for the viewer. Yes? Um, but I was really interested in the idea of um, uh, limitations and this idea that the blank pieces of paper is ostensibly free and limitations are limiting, but actually you can flip around and say uh, the blank piece of paper is, um, you, you revert to what you know, and the limitations give you something to bounce off. And, but what I was wondering is if there's not a third way to look at it where you reverse it back again and you say, actually pushing against those limitations while they might allow you to kind of produce a sense of uh, novelty and uh, like make you very productive and produce what could be a more kind of, um, well, I don't know, um, actually being confronted with a blank page forces you, you kind of freeze and then you go, what do I have to say? Uh, like, what does it mean to say? Who is it that speaks? And all this whole host of kind of like almost ontological questions that you don't get if you're kind of constantly like, uh, I'll just say that. No, that, that makes perfect sense to me. And, and I agree. I think that there, the, there's probably five or six different ways in which you might go from a blank piece of paper to a series of surprising drawings rather than just unicorns and stars. I just presented my model, I guess. And, and partly that's because it's, it, it's in keeping with the way I do things. I'm, I am a bit of a control freak, and, and I'm more, and I speak more emphatically than I actually mean to. So I often seem like I'm being really um, certain about something, and I'm only certain of that thing at the moment in which I say it for that particular moment in time. But but because I, I have a certain um, I'm dogged by a certain sort of logical thought, which is not always that helpful. I, I can seem a bit more sort of dogmatic and empirical than I really mean to be. So, so that's why that model works for me, because I sort of make fun of myself in the doing of that model, and I, and I like that for me. But yes, I agree with you. You could set a whole series of challenges and questions to the group of students that wouldn't be as in, you know, particular as my instruction, that would also lead to surprising drawings. Yes, yes, I think you're right. the art education um, to me is um, basically what should happen with education at all and, uh, and um, the ways the art education develops or should develop um, in my opinion should be more in incorporated in the mainstream education in general but it's just a comment uh, which leads me to the question uh, if you could tell a little bit more about what uh, your work with teachers of other subjects looked like? Because this would be something very I'll give you two examples then. The first is I completely agree with you. Um, and an interesting example of how that might be strategically useful is we have, uh, within the art programme at CSM, we have the only maths unit Maths units exist in lots of other uh, colleges and lots of other um, universities, but they exist within universities where maths is a requirement for the subject. So if you're doing engineering, you'll have a maths unit, and students will go to the maths unit if they're falling behind on the mathematics that underpin the engineering to get a bit of extra support to help them do that. We set up a maths unit within 
the art program because we were interested in the sort of philosophical implications of multiple dimensions um, on the one hand and we were also interested in for those students who needed to know how much plywood to buy when they wanted to make that sculpture how they would figure it out and so our maths unit does does that and one thing that could be very interesting about the maths unit would be to say we've developed a series of learning um, guides for the courses that the maths unit runs and one of the ones it runs is um, multiple dimensions, another one is perspective, another one is um, uh, looking at topology but we're doing it from the point of view of why an artist would be interested in those things and we're, and we're making things that are about the art of it but that perhaps that might be also useful for further down the chain for students for whom mathematics is terribly difficult because they're getting it in a very visual language that might be helpful for them. Now this is really, it was close to my heart because my son has a real block about maths and, and I don't and I, and I genuinely find it bewildering. I don't understand why he doesn't understand it. But then when I, when I go to him with some of the things that the, that the students have provided within this, he seems to get it more. And it's something about the way they're doing it that seems more in keeping with his way of thinking. So I think that could be useful. And the, the real benefit of that is that we can then turn around to government and say, it's not that art is a subject in its own right and needs to be funded because it's a really important subject. It's a subject in its own right that can provide information for other subjects about how to teach those subjects in in different ways and that's not to say that everyone will learn maths through the visual language of, of what these people have produced but a, for a group of students that could be very very beneficial and so I think as a strategy it's a really wise one and potentially a really useful one um, and then in terms of what I did with the teachers um, it was over the course of of a year and it was um, it was a set of very practical workshops that each week would take a different um, set of, uh, of um, things within the national curriculum and I'd make art workshops about them. So it might be around, you know, there might be something around um, the language of, so it's so different forms of language at primary school where you learn about, you know, uh, advertising language versus political language versus and you, you start to understand how you might use words to, to, to sell or to pass on information or to do these things. And, and we made, in response to that, we made a video piece where we made a series of protest banners that paraded around the building. And, and so it was very, very visual. Yes, it had words within it, but we understood the power of the words because the power was partly the power of this giant billboard that was bloody heavy and it fell on your head, it would have hurt. And so there was, there was, it was just, it was quite simple really. It wasn't, it wasn't anything too complex, but it meant that there were a series of possible ways in which you could turn something that might otherwise be difficult for certain students to access into something that hopefully, through its performativity, through its collaborativeness, uh, allowed more students to engage with it. Now, I have to say, these projects aren't always successful, um, and sometimes I think... I can be very naive and I think the problem with interdisciplinarity is that uh, one discipline often has misconceptions about the other and I see this a lot at art school where we try to collaborate between the programmes and so for example um, art students imagine that what graphic communication students can do is design their posters for them and fashion students imagine that what art students can do for them is provide a backdrop for their beautiful dresses. And it's, it's to fundamentally misunderstand what graphic communication does, what fine art does, what, what fashion does. So we need to do a little bit of getting into the mindset of the other discipline before we can really start to make progress in this area. It, it's very easy to have an idea of what maths is, of what history is, of what these subjects are. So it, it's not always successful. But I think that overall, over the year, the teachers were very, they were very positive and, and they came up with better solutions than I instigated but we we had within the system of it we had a system where they could come back with a revised workshop plan that they would then take back to their schools and it seemed it seemed to work okay i don't think it, it, it transformed the way they taught everything it, it could never have done that but i think it was, it was a small step that started some interesting conversations amongst themselves that might then have been taken further
Thank you.